a person from Gujarat was banished because he was a bandit. He was the son of the king, but he turned out to be a bandit. And he and his group were uh, they banished from Gujarat. And they came first to a place called Baruki Chen, which was an Indian port. And Baruki Chen is today known as Baruch. And the people have heard a lot about them, and they said, no, you are not welcome here. You can go anywhere else, but your boat refugees not wanted here. Then they came to Suparaka, and yesterday, Dr. Lancaster pointed out that Suparaka, today known as Supara, was a well-known port, and one of the Jataka stories of Buddhism talks of ship that went from that to the Babylonian kingdom or the Babylonian civilization. You see, the reason why the then known world needed all this communication was that there were so many centers of highly developed civilizations. The Egyptian civilization going to at least 10,000 years. The Babylonian civilization. Indus Valley civilization. Chinese civilization on the eastern side. Then also the other, as the Aryans came to settle down, the various other Hittites and the Mittites and the Greeks and the uh, the, Italian, uh, the Latins, all the uh, Romans, all these Gaelic and the Celtic, all these civilizations were here. So they needed the communication. And the ships provided a good amount of opportunity for this communication to take place. So already we know from the Indus Valley Civilization artifacts that there was trade between these civilizations. Now why did they come to the East for the very simple reason that they were the spices. And may not be always the spices, but there might have been other needs also. I mentioned that King Vijaya of Sri Lanka came from Gujarat to the western coast. Then when Ashoka sent his daughter with the sapling of the tree of enlightenment or the Bodhi tree, she came to the north, the very northern part of Sri Lanka. That's right there. That was a well-known port called Chapakola. Connected to India, to the, where one of the estuaries of the Ganges River near Calcutta, called uh, Tamralipti. That was a regular seven day trip from India to Sri Lanka. Then we had another son of a brother of Vijaya coming from Gujarat, apparently taking cover right round the Cape of India and landing in Trincomalee, where you see uh, the one where there's a little right on there, that harbour, the east. You see a place where there is Yeah, that's a deep sea harbour, and that was there. 32 of them landed. Then we had another group. There was a young prince, princess rather, who was wanted by too many suitors. The father had a big problem in India when too many suitors want the same girl. 
So he put the girl on a ship and sent her down the river. And she ended up in the same harbor. And there were three known waves of immigration to this country. So Sri Lanka was colonized by North India. And that is the reason why the majority of the people of Sri Lanka are speaking a North Indian dialect, a derivative of Sanskrit and Pali, rather than a Dravidian language like Tamil, Malayalam, uh, Kannada, or Tirupu. It's a completely different language. So our relations have been with North India. But as far as international relations were concerned, we were the midpoint for the maritime Silk Route. And the Silk Route, did it take Silk up and down? Yes. Matai Harbour, we have so far had four excavations. And to our greatest satisfaction, all that our books say, whether it is Greek, Latin, or Pali as in Sri Lankan, as our books say, we find artifacts of all these countries. I don't think you have found anywhere a 2,000 year old piece of silk, the purple colored silk, the color being the sign of royalty. We found a web of that silk there in the Mantai Harbor. We found glazed tiles that come only from China, not only in the harbor, but also in several temples, several stupas in the capital of the country. And we also know that there was one product of Sri Lanka which everybody wanted, and that was called treacle. And treacle is a syrup that is got from the flower, by the sap of a flower, of a tree that cannot be cultivated but grows in the jungle. And even today, if you go to any of these if Sri Lankan products are sold, they would always have that syrup, the trickle, available today. And this is supposed to be the favorite of the royalty and the aristocracy. What are the goods were required? The tiny ships brought whatever they wanted to send to Rome or the Greeks earlier. If the Greeks who first came, and I think I should have mentioned a while ago is fourth century before Christ, when the city of Anuradhapura, which is the capital, was planned, that king set apart the western suburb as a Greek colony for merchants. Referred to in Pali as the settlement of the Yona, and the Yona, Ionian, was the name for the Greeks. <coughs> so already this is a country which is no longer isolated from the world. Then we come to the first century, the time of Augustus Caesar and Claudius, and there was an embassy of Sri Lanka in Rome. I'll give you the next one. In 
In Rome, Silakan's ambassador was interviewed by a Latin journalist, I would like to call him, Pliny the Elder. Both father and son are known to have left wonderful Latin records of their findings, of their contemporary uh, situations. Pliny the Younger has recorded Pompeii, what happened to Pompeii and her career. And the Pliny the Elder has interviewed the Sri Lankan ambassador. And as you know that all ambassadors are paid to lie abroad for the good of their country. And our man, 2,000 years ago, had just done the job exactly as I would have done. And even painted a very fine picture of Sri Lanka. And Pliny says, Rome should do their economy the way the Sri Lanka has, their government and all that good words have been said by him. And then asked, what about you of very He said, oh, my father is holding the similar post in China. So here is a little tiny island represented in the two ends of the world. And what do they do? What have we, they been able to achieve? And then we see that all these things were possible with China because we had a link, and the link was Buddhism. Buddhism has provided an opportunity for a message of peace, a message of compassion to be spread worldwide by committed monastics. You see, Buddhism turns out to be the first known religion to have adopted the missionary role. As you all know, when the Buddha had only 60 followers, in the month of July, or just two weeks ago, for the anniversary, he addressed them and said, Go, go on missions and tell the world that a new path to immortality has been found. And no two of you should go on the same road. So he wanted 60 people to go. And all our monastics here carry on that tradition of the 60 monastics that the Buddha sent out. Sri Lanka had the opportunity of getting Buddhism before most other countries which have Buddhism today. I don't think Ashoka was spreading Buddhism to Sri Lanka without a political motive. He chose Sri Lanka to send his own son and the daughter. And uh, most interestingly, and few people know this, he said also their uncle, eight uncles, to take over the civil administration of the country. And within 200 years, they replaced the original dynasty and Ashoka's uncle's dynasty took over the ruling of the country and the last of them was recorded as late as the 15th century. So there must have been a very important commercial, security or political reason why Buddhism was used as a way by which a tremendous impact could be made on Sri Lanka. Of course, he sent along with them 
all the artisans so that much of the culture of india could come in we got a script the same brahmi script is what sri lanka began writing with so what record do we have of the role that was played by the monastic sub sri lanka with regard to check we look in for evidence and we didn't find anything recorded in sri lankan history we didn't have anything directly recorded in the early stages in chinese history but we find a piece of interesting evidence coming from india okay next one Now this is a place called Andhra Pradesh, and you will see that the Nagarjuna Konda. Nagarjuna Konda was a very important Buddhist center. There was a stupa, a uh, lot of interesting sculptures, and we found several inscriptions in the Prakrit language. and in this is reference made to a sihala vihara sihala vihara means a temple of the sinhalis and they had they wanted to give the sri lankan monk uh, the dev sri lankan monks there a devotee wanted to build for that temple two architectural features of a sri lankan temple can be the next one you know sri lanka's temples had two features that are very unusual that circular thing on the other side is called a bodhi gara and that was a building or a structure around a bodhi tree so one of them was been replicated in nagarjuna konda for the benefit of the sri lankan monks who were living there in the sri lankan temple or the sikha sihala vihara and this is called a chetiya gana you have a stupa and you build a house over the stupa to cover it and the chetiya gana had not been found anywhere else in the world It's only in Sri Lanka they protected the stupa by building a house about it. The very first stupa that was built called the Tuparama. We still have the columns that supported the roof. And in presenting to the Sri Lankan monks there, they say these Sri Lankan monks in that temple. were highly venerated for the role they played in spreading buddhism to kashmir china and various parts of india china is particularly mentioned as where the sri lankan monks have gone by that time in the second or the third century of the current era to spread buddhism these monks have left a mark in chinese literature in sri lanka we had all schools of buddhism meeting in one place 
We had three monasteries in the capital. The first monastery established by the son of Ashoka himself called the Mahavihara, the great monastery, is a conservative monastery which preserved or which said to, uh, which stated that it preserved the Theravada. You know what was called Theravada, the tradition of monastics, tradition of elders, is to that day. In the first century, two centuries afterwards, a king found himself thrown out of his throne by the, by the South Indian invaders. He had to find shelter all over the country and usually in temples out of the way. And when he became the king again, he wanted to do something special for those monks who helped him when he was a fugitive trying to escape the invaders. And he set up what is called the Abhir Giri Vihara, a certain monastery. And this certain monastery had some leanings towards Maya. It was a meeting place of both. They studied Pali, they had their some records in Pali, <coughs> but they also adopted Sanskrit and they had Sanskrit Mahayana Sutras no doubt. But how much they were oriented to Mahayana is indicated by an inscription which shows that all regulations governing the inmates of that monastery were written in Sanskrit. Not Pali. <coughs> Mahavihara used Pali, this used Sanskrit. Another 200 years afterwards, a king really took to the, I mean, he was in favor of Abhagiriya and did a lot to damage Mahavihara. To the extent that one of his ministers declared war against him. And one of the episodes of Sri Lankan history is how Buddhism played a role. The minister and the king and their armies ready to start the battle the next morning. And the minister was served with his dinner hamper, a curry that the, the king and the minister enjoyed together. So with great danger to himself, he carried his own hamper of food across the battlefield shared the dinner with the king, talked the night over, and there was no need to fight. So the problem that was between the two monasteries on account of the Theravada and the Mahayana and all these things was settled over a nice dinner. This king established a third monastery. And this third monastery also took to Mahayana. To the extent, when in 1980 we excavated that stupa for renovation or for conservation, we discover a copy of the Pratyaparamita in Sanskrit engraved in Sinhalese characters, Sinhalese letters. 
and the text is Sanskrit, written on bold sheets. The, the gold book of 13 sheets. In other words, they have begun to worship books. You know, we know about Namomiya Orenge Kyo Vyadi, Lotus Sutra is being venerated and worshipped. Already we see the Prachaparamita in Sri Lanka. So this being the center of both these two religions, or two traditions of the same religion, enabled the contribution to China to be made very directly. One of the books that was produced by Abhigiri was called Vimutti Manka, The Path of Liberation. And we already find in the 4th century this book translated into Chinese. as a Sia Tao Lu. I may be pronouncing Chinese wrong because I can't read it. I could stop my study of Chinese because I could get the tones I know musical ear. So Sia Tao Long is a Vimutti manga already translated. And the authorship given to Upatissa of Abhe Girviyara so you know what they about Chinese translators? They are very careful about plagiarism. They didn't know all the rules about plagiarism, but they always told from whom they got the tea. Now that was good enough evidence that our monks were doing something useful there. Then comes fire to India. Now, as you already know, fire had to come to India in search of the Vinaya or the books on discipline of the Sakta, because at that time a particular movement started in China. Again, I may be pronouncing the names wrong, I can say now. Who said, Buddhism to prosper, you must have all four parts of the congregation. Bhikkhus, the monks, Bhikkhunis, the nuns, the Upasakas, the male devotees, Upasakas, the female devotees. And in order to bring the Sangha, to be exactly like the Sangha that the Buddha was intended, they had to know what the Vinaya was. So they thought, oh, Buddhism arose in India. If you come to India, you can get the Vinaya. Yeah, Vinaya was there in India. There was the Mahasangika school whose Vinaya was available, but only orally. So if Vahyan wanted to that, uh, take uh, that bin in there, he had to carry a person from uh, across the Himalayas who will be able to recite it to the people in China. Then somebody said, go to Sri Lanka, you might find books. And he came to Sri Lanka and found that the Mahasa, uh, this, uh, the Mahasaska or the Tamaguptika Vinaya was already there, the Vinaya in four parts, and they took it. And that is how we find that the Sangha of the entire Mahayana or Theravada or Mahayana or Southern, we are bound by the exactly the same rules and regulations.
the Pati Mokka, as they say, the basic rules, 227, as far as Theravada was concerned, it goes to 250 and 253, but still the basic Vinaya is the same. Now, Fayyas visit to Sri Lanka was very interesting. He stayed in Abhagiriya, showing that Abhagiriya is now very much inclined to Mahayana. And he said that about 5,000 monastics in Abhagiriya. And you would ask me, can that be perfect, right? I have to say so because there's a stone boat or a trough for the midday meal of rice for the Sangha in the refectory. And that is just enough to for 5,000 people. If you fill that, good. And there's a smaller one for the curry and that also was the size. So the size indicates that Payan was correct. He had not made the exaggeration of the Dhamma. And the Mahavihari, he says, had only 3,000. So you can see how Sri Lanka's Buddhism evolved with this the interaction of these two and the extent to which Chinese pilgrim going to a big area, spending two years writing a very interesting account of his voyage for Kyoki and uh, telling us many things about what we did not know. Now before I come to what happened to Pai Hien and how I connect Pai Hien with the rest of the route, let me tell you something about something that followed immediately after Pai Hien's visit. We had the Vinaya, but we had the, uh, the Buddha's own words as we believe. But a commentary that was written on it in the Sinhala language. A monk by the name of Sangabhadra in 435 CE, as somebody calculates, took a copy of this to China and it translated into Chinese. Now that is called Shen Jian Ru Piposa. Shen Jian Ru Piposa, until very recent times, most people thought it was translated from Pali into Chinese. And the Pali was the one that was written by Buddha Gosha. But I had the opportunity to come to know about this book and do a thorough study. And to my great surprise, I found that this is not translated from Pali into Chinese, but from Sinhalese into Chinese. And one particular word gave me the clue. There is an office which you call in Sanskrit Tushkara, Tushkruta, minor office, which occurs in Pali as Dukkata. And if a translated or transliterated into Chinese would be close to Dushkruta or Dushkruta. Instead of we find the ancient Sinhalese word Dukula in Sanjay Drupi Pusa. So here is another piece of evidence for us. And then we keep on going further. Can you go to the next one, please? Mm -hmm. 
and this is about the Dukkata, which I say, has come from the secret of the Jitapa. Fine, apparently also must have left in the Sri Lankan mind some kind of need to help China at that time. So, a nun by the name of Devasara, I think the next one please, a nun by the name of, oh, it is still one for the other, no, after that, after, yeah, nun by the name of Devasara took it. Eight nuns and went by ship, using the maritime silk route, to establish the Bhikkhuni Sasana or the order of nuns in China. How do we know? It is recorded in a Chinese book called Pichuni Chuan, the story of Bhikkhunis. And we know the name of even the captain of the ship because when they went there, they found they did not have ten nuns. She made a rock calculation that there might be a couple of nuns already in China who could be involved in the ordination. The ship went back. And by the time it came, the ordination could be had only 10 years later, I think in 439 CD. So this pious visit seemed to have had, had much more impact than we thought. Then Pius decided to go back, now go back to the previous one please. He came from India, from Tabralipti to uh, this uh, Gokana or the Trikamali. And then he went via Java. And the reason to go via Java was to see to what extent Buddhism had an impact in that country. And he says Buddhism is not very highly regarded there <coughs> at that time uh, because it was. 5th century, beginning of the 5th century. But the very fact that he went there indicated that this sea route had a particular way of touching the different countries of the way. And as a result, he had a very bad time with the ship. There was a storm and people thought that it is unlucky to carry a monastic and he was about to be thrown on the shore in the place that he didn't know. But there was somebody that was influential enough to save him. But his record tells us that there were others who were also interested in coming. Sun Chan came to India spent a long time there, kept a wonderful record of this in uh, Siyoki. And we know a lot about what he did in India, saw in India, but he couldn't come to Sri Lanka because there was some kind of civil upheaval at that time in the country. So he stayed on the coast in the Tamil Nadu, as you call the Cape, uh, the Indian part and collected whatever information and chapter 12 of this book contains uh, what he heard and as you know hearsay information is not always 100% correct there are a few errors that have kept in because the people who informed him would not have been fully informed and as a result that uh, may not be very useful but one fact is that China was interested in what was going on in Sri Lanka and Shwetsan wanted to visit Sri Lanka and study Buddhism there too. Then, 
we come to the Tang dynasty. And by the time we come to the Tang dynasty, the, the annals written of the Tang dynasty by a friend called Li Chao. And Li Chao gives some interesting information of Sri Lanka. And he says, in the 7th century, the Sri Lankan ships were the largest ships that came to China. <clears throat> were there many ships coming to China? When a man called, uh, one of them, now the very important missionaries called Amoga Vajra, came with this speech of Vajra Bodhi from Sri Lanka and came to China. He records that when he got into the ship to go to China, there were 35 Persian ships that were in the harbor already in Sri Lanka, apparently going the same way. So this is a very busy maritime route. And Amoka Vajra came, and as you know, he taught Vajrayana. He was able to show some magical prowess to the king or the emperor, and therefore he got all the wonderful titles and venerations and initial record. He the best recorded of the mysteries that we have of China, but he came from Sri Lanka. Another person who was recorded like that is Gunavarman. Gunavarman was the king uh, was given the kingship of Kashmir. And he said, oh, I'd rather become a monastic. He became a monastic and came to Abhegiri, studied Vinaya in Abhegiri, went to China for a while, came to China, uh, came to, I mean, went to uh, the, uh, Indonesia for a while, then went to China, and in China he became a great authority on the Vinaya, recorded in your literature. Similarly, there were many such missions that have been going up and down. By when it come to the 15th century, Chinese literature records 64 missions from Sri Lanka to the imperial court of China. And of this, 10 took place after the 15th century voyages of Chen Ho, Chen Ho, I know Chen Ho. Chen Ho went to the port where I was born, in the Gaul, in the southern part of Sri Lanka, and uh, left a colony there, and that colony is still called the China Garden, and I happened to be born in China Garden, and they relate there ancestry to the Chinnas and Chinna went there for no other reason but to ask for the tooth relic. Now this tooth relic has an interest in the history with China. Yi Jin or Yi Jin records that as many as five of the 52 biographies of uh, eminent monks referred to monks who have gone to Sri Lanka to study Buddhism. And one of those monks had been, the eminent monk, had been given an audience by the king who showed him the tooth relic. And this monk is supposed to have stolen the tooth relic. And the king had to have him stripped, stripped to search him. And after stripped, he uh, searched, found the tooth relic hidden. And the tooth relic had never been manhandled after that. They said they kept it safe because we know. China wanted that tooth relic. We brought to China. And the king refused. And they abducted the king and his family and brought it for some time to Sri Lanka and from China. And that is the kind of good and bad relationship that we have had. And our history is full of this 
admiration that 64 missions could be sent from Sri Lanka and 10 of them in the 15th century alone. Then what happened to us? Rome disappeared <coughs> from the scene. Rome did not have any more trade links with Sri Lanka or China. Persians and Arabs took over the trade. China on its part had a great need to come to Asia, our part of the world, Sri Lankan part, because not only to trade with Rome and Greece, but also to take something from us and that was rice and iron. You know, we never thought that Sri Lanka could be exporting iron till we read an Arab uh, writer who says that to make one of those Arab swords, you have to get the best iron from Sri Lanka. So, to say that the iron should come from Serenti, that was the name that the Arabs gave to our country, was to say that I, and now our excavations of the country, we have found two furnaces of commercial standard. Commercial standard. Furnaces with which iron ore had been modified or transformed into iron for export purposes. And when Rich Chow says that the chips are large, it was because they brought elephants, they brought iron, and they brought Buddhism. And Sri Lanka got many things from China in the same way that our temples got some wonderful works of art, clay styles and the like, which are directly influenced. Yesterday, Dr. Ancaster showed the tar uh, the Avalokiteshwara and Tara, the statue. We have several of them in Sri Lanka. And that is another connection that we had as a result of our very Chinese connection. And all our harbors have some kind of direct connection to Mahayana Buddhism. Although Sri Lanka happened to be a basically a Pali oriented country today. But that happened in the 12th century. And the 12th century that happened because one of the kings, very powerful kings, who ruled for 55 years, he said, the three monasteries can't exist like this. You must unify. And he got scholars to work on their scriptures. And they said, except the Pali scriptures and the canon except all other rituals and other things. So today's Buddhism, which we call in Sri Lanka uh, the Singhala reform, using a word used by a French scholar, Sede, and the Singhala reform is an amalgam of all three. Canonical is, Mahabha, is the Theravada, all the other practices of Buddhism turn out to be coming from the Mahayana and also the Vajrayana. We have all kinds of things which show that in the 12th century we prepared, we prepared an amalgam of Buddhism that could go via the maritime trade route to Myanmar, to Thailand, to Cambodia, Laos, and the Mekong Valley. Again, the Sri Lankan monks played a big role. But the maritime rule that made it possible for them to go to these countries. The Buddhism that exists in Southeast Asia today is the Sinhala reform. It is what makes the Buddhism more appealing to the people what is that it looks after the monastic aspect of the religion as well as the lay requirements of somebody to pray to 
have a bodhisattva to pray to. Have a wider range of rituals which would satisfy them. And therefore our relations together had made Buddhism a very interestingly viable amalgam of all that Buddhist traditions had developed in the world. This is the little information that I want to share because to me both these countries, China and Sri Lanka, are very important in the history of Buddhism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gurbet, for this very enlightening lecture. Uh, I'm sure there will be some questions. Uh, those who want to ask questions, you have microphone in front of you. Please turn it on. Thanks. Please, please. Yes, President. <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting Today, after listening to your talk between China and, and Sri Lanka, I just wonder which side is more influenced by which side? Is that China more influenced by the Sri Lankan side or Sri Lankan side has been more influenced by China in terms of the you know, Buddhism in between? President, being a diplomat, I don't like to answer that question, <laughs> but uh, still I'm going to tell you. <laughs> you know, we have been taught to answer this kind of question by saying, oh yeah, it happened for both sides, that's it. But when you look at the evidence that we can so far uh, present to the world, the inscriptions that in India where the Sri Lankan monks have been credited for having taken a part in the spread of Buddhism there. And that several records that have been maintained in uh, China, for example, they talk in terms of five monks that came to Sri Lanka, uh, from Sri Lanka to China, and they say one of them was a, had a great talent for sculpture. Then we have a record about Lungan, where it is recorded that 42,000 workmen worked for 50 years to do the sculptures. I'm sorry, I had a picture of that over this. Yeah. I was looking at the clock and I was trying to rush through. Yeah. There, they say, a group of Sri Lankan sculptors also worked there, is recorded in China. Then we have Xie Tao Lung, a book of China that is, uh, uh, that is in China, but went from Sri Lanka, accredited to Sri Lankan Mountain. Then Sanjian Rupi Posa, 
the Vinaya commentary, the only Vinaya commentary available in Chinese, which is a translation of the Sidonese book. And Devasara taking the order of Bhikkhunis, and then I say, in comparison I can show that Mahayana in Sri Lanka would certainly have developed if not for interaction with those who have come from China. That the clear styles in many places that we have found in our excavations would not have come other than from China. And uh, we have a fortress called Sigiriya. And this fortress has a mirror which is 1,000 years, 500 years old now. We call it the mirror, villa, uh, mirror wall because it is very, very nicely placed. And so far we have found about 2,000 little poems written by visitors. You see, they don't write their initials or how, but they wrote a little verse. And uh, one of those verses talk in terms of the girls that are depicted in the figure. You know, there were 500 women painted on a rock by the king. 36 are not even today visible. And uh, one, one of those words says, Oh, you are wearing China Pata. China Pata, Pata means in Sinhalese silk. China Pata means Chinese silk. So you see that the two countries have influenced each other in equal measure. And that's a very diplomatic <laughs> but we often, we often say, and uh, this is what I've been told, I've, I've been learning, is that uh, in China, our Buddhist, uh, our, our, our Buddhism actually came from India. We have, you know, during the uh, history, we have mountains. So we went to India to learn the Buddhism and uh, carry a lot of knowledge of Buddhism back to China. Uh, I just wonder, the uh, Buddhism in Sri Lanka, do they also originate from India? Naturally, Buddha was born in India. Yeah, so where does it go through? Through, you know, directly from India to Sri Lanka or? From India, Buddhism came with the son and the daughter of King Ashoka, Emperor Ashoka himself. And as I mentioned, Ashoka seemed to have had more than one reason to send his old son and the daughter. And eight of their uncles who were asked to take over the civil administration of the country when Buddhism was sent. So, Sri Lanka received in the time of Ashoka uh, with a special attention. You know, I have uh, done some work on Ashoka and it turned out to be a huge volume called uh, uh, the Definitive Biography of Ashoka. And uh, in this I try to give all the evidence from every available source on Ashoka's missionary purposes. But Sri Lanka was so special to him. And this is the reason why Sri Lanka has 2,300 years of unbroken record of Buddhism. And it's also one of the reasons why Sri Lanka also played a major role in sending Buddhism out to other countries. We find very interesting evidence from Southeast Asia on the role that Sri Lankan monks played. Now, we know that Thailand also received a missionary from the Ashoka, according to records. But we know record of Buddhism have been lasted that long in Thailand. 
We know that Dwaravati, that's one of the kingdoms, had this. And there, when we look for evidence, we find an inscription with a, a poem in Pali. And the, nobody knew from where this poem came. Until we found that this poem is one that is, tells a story of something that happened in the 2nd century BC in Sri Lanka, where a king uh, made the uh, wrong identification and had uh, Arahant burned in a cauldron of oil. And that poem is called Tela Katahata. It's a Sri Lanka story, the book, the story originated in Sri Lanka, written in Sri Lanka, and the opening verses of this are recorded in stone in Thailand in the 9th century. Then we go to Ajanta. And Ajanta, as you know, was a great monastery where caves were dug into and painted with the most exquisite murals. And the biggest wall has the arrival of the sceneries in Sri Lanka. Now, who could have done that? Who could have given the biggest wall the most impressive uh, the painting for an incident in the history of Sri Lanka unless somebody in Sri Lanka was in some authority there. Then when you ask, can Sri Lanka play that kind of role in India? Have we just referred to Adhidev? Arya Deva was a Sri Lankan prince. He became a student of Nagarjuna. And what happened at the end of it? When after Nagarjuna, Arya Deva became the abbot of the Nalanda University. So this is, our little country has a lot of things to be proud of. Now we also ask, did Sri Lanka have a role to play in the West? The earliest known record of Buddhism in the West is a little sentence or two sentences by Saint Clementi of Alexandria, Egypt. And the Buddha that he describes and the Buddhism he describes is the kind of Buddhism that was practiced in Sri Lanka. And it is possibly that not only did Buddhism go towards China, but it seemed to have also the monks must have been up and down to the West as well. So today we are studying more and more of our relationships in the world. 20 years ago, what I say would have been totally unknown to me. I would have been like anyone else in the world, not knowing that Buddhism played this kind of role. But today we are studies. And the more we study, the more evidence we get, and we are just surprised. These Buddhist monks have been great missionaries. Buddhist nuns have been great missionaries. We are just carrying on the tradition today. A lot of things for, for us to be very proud of for all sides. Wherever we are Buddhist, we have been communicating with each other.
I think there's a lot of studies that could be done further because my knowledge is that the Chinese is nil. I fortunately had these Chinese colleagues working with me, helping me, with me to search some of this material. And I'm promoting some of the Chinese and the Vietnamese and others to do this kind of study. And I hope that we'll have more knowledge and this university might be able to make further contributions. What more remains to be known in the world, we don't know. Alright, any more questions or comments, Professor? Quick <coughs> question. Yes, please. The influence of uh, Sri Lankan Buddhism in Tibet. It's considering that this is a maritime silk route that we're talking about. There was another silk route that was running from the north part of India through Tibet to China. So I would imagine what a lot of Buddhism from India would follow that path, but a quicker one. Can I use a mic, please? Use a mic. Yes. Uh, just to be, to be more concise, uh, the influence of uh, Sri Lankan Buddhism <coughs> in Tibet, it was how much was the influence Kisk, of the Sri Lankan? Uh, so far, we are not uh, found any connection with Sri Lanka and Tibet. So far, no. But do we have the Vajrayana, the, what went to Tibet, possibly coming from India, the country Buddhism, to Sri Lanka we have with us. In fact, we have about the only place where there is a mandala that I have been carved on a huge rock. You know the mandala that is used oh, in the I'm being, being Hindu, I know what a mandala is. And, uh, that mandala in Anuradhapura, in the first capital. So it had happened sometime before the 7th or 8th century of the current era. And so we know that. And our history of the, uh, we have a history called the Nikaya Sangraha, uh, history of Buddhism. And they called that we received at one stage the Vajrayana, which they call the Nila Pata Darshana. That is the philosophy of those who were wearing black. Nila meant the blue, but it meant also that, the black robes. The black robe uh, philosophy and how the kings tried to suppress it is recorded in our literature. So we have had all these branches coming, but not this big Tibet, we are not. But as I said 20 years ago, we didn't know what relationship we had with China. And now we know. And if we go deeper into the city we might find that these Buddhist bonds went all over. It was not a one way. Fire did not cross the Himalayas, sunshine did not cross the Himalayas. There must be others who crossed the other way. But Umaraji will apparently cross from the Himalayas the other way. There will be other monks who died. And that just uh Uh, just mentioning the, uh, the fact that Tibetan monks went to Sumatra to study Tantra is well established. So I suppose that given the fact that they were going to Sumatra, that they were coming, they were part of that whole systemic thing that included Sri Lanka. No, Sri Vijaya, you know, I didn't want to touch on Sri Vijaya because you were, I did a very good analysis yesterday of Sri Vijaya. Uh, Sri Vijaya was another great center of Buddhism. We are, fortunately we have a good record left behind by Yijin or Yijin. And he says that, uh, he recommends to Chinese students, uh, before you go to Nalanda or to India, 
India had at that time several universities, all of them teaching the tantric Buddhism mostly. There was Wallabi and all of them places like that. And there are the, uh, he says, come and stay in Sriboga, which is Palimbong today and it is uh, the capital of the Srivijaya Empire. And uh, first master your Sanskrit and then go to India to study. So it was a, it was a place which received a lot of uh, the students. And up, uh, the Sri Lankan monks certainly went to Indonesia. And I mentioned Sri Vidal, Sri Harabita, Vihara, that is the Singhalese. Singhalese is our ethnicity. Singhalese, we are the monastery. I mentioned in Nagarjuna Hotel. We have one recorded, and very interestingly, recorded in our books, recorded in Chinese books, and also supported by a series of inscriptions in Buddhaya, where the Sri Lankan Vihara existed. And to our greatest surprise, a Dutch archaeologist, Kasper, uh, found that there's an inscription in Ratuboka. And Ratuboka is the capital of the uh, Shailendra Empire in Indonesia where it refers to a branch of the Abhegiri Vihara of the Sikhala Kingdom established there. So this uh, established monasteries in different places that we seem to be one of our uh, uh, special features in history. You know, there's such a lot that we can examining in the history of our faith. Okay. And the more we understand it, the greater becomes our veneration for the Mahasangha. You know, the greatest institution that the Buddha did for us is the monastic system. One of the earliest to be known, one of them will preserved having a long history, well-regulated, self-renewing, self-policing. This kind of organization has lived for 2,600 years. And we owe all that we know about Buddhism, all that we know as compassion, tolerance, understanding, all those great Buddhist values Thanks to the Mahasana. When we think in terms of a great present day Buddhist leader like Master Shenyun, <coughs> we say, without him and without his following the ideals of Mahasana, would we, all of us around here, have this wonderful opportunity to be There's people like him. Our history is full of people like him. And this is why we venerate him. We consider him to be, I consider him to be one of the most influential Buddhist leaders of the 20th and the 21st century. Over 200 institutions that he had established in the world today speaks for his dynamism, efficiency, enthusiasm, and commitment. And all of us are benefiting from that. And we are benefiting in the same way from many generations of similar Did not plan for a year. If you plan for a year, you would have planned it twice. He didn't plan 
but ten years, in which case you have planted trees. But he planted for thousands of years, and therefore he educated people. And that education is what we, in our own humble way, try to promote and develop to the extent our resources permit. Dr. Lancaster and I, and I'm sure the faculty, all of you, we are bound by this one commitment. Here we have something to share with the world, and let us share it with generosity. 